Here we go. Good evening, guys. Thanks for joining Target Shooting UK live stream. Um, tonight, we are on Target having a discussion about practical shooting. And we're going to be speaking to some of these characters. They're up here. We got John Axe at the top as usual. Hi, John. Hi. Can check the camera, see what happens. Oliver Bloomfield, just down here. Yeah. We got Amrik Sings. Hello. We'll break in there. Guys, thanks very much for joining us. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a discussion this evening about packing shooting. We're going to talk about uh, the transition, perhaps, between Airsoft to Three Gun. We're going to be talking to Ollie here, who is probably the more experienced shooter out of the him and the young chap above him and myself, apart from John, who is a very experienced three gun shooter. You know, Ollie, I want to start with you. Um, just get a little bit of background on yourself. I want I want you to tell us about yourself in terms of how you got into shooting and how that extended itself to where you are now. Uh, evening, thanks for having me. Uh, basically, I started out clay pigeon shooting like a lot of people. Um, it was actually my last day of freedom with my stag do. Uh, experienced the 12 gauge for the first time. The bug bit. Um, moved on, did a few. I think I had an over and under for three weeks. And then I went and bought my first pump action shotgun, section two. Um, I found out about a local club that were opening their membership for the first time in five years. And I got in contact with a few of them through the local gun shop that was open near me. Uh, went down there, had a look around, thought, wow, this just blew my mind. This, you know, what we can do this kind of thing. Now, obviously there's a lot of things we can't do now, legalities and all that, but this was, it was a total trip. So uh, I just went on from there, started my probationary, uh, Obviously, that means you're making the cups of tea, sweeping up. You're doing all the you're doing all the apprentice stuff. You know, if they wanted someone to go up on the club roof, up I went. Uh, <laughs> just went on from there, moved on to section ones, <clears throat> and it's really progressed. Um, now I'm at the point where I don't really own any shotguns. They're all firearms um, or firearms registered, and I've obviously met people in the, over the years. That have helped me, helped to progress my uh, career. I don't know if you want to call it that. And just gone on from there. I've just basically anything that goes pop, fizzle, or bang, if I can play with it, I want to play on it. Um, and it's been it's been a learning curve. Uh, the first five years was very, very limited because there weren't many clubs, there wasn't many functions and things open. Um, found out about Shield Shooting Centre, you know, let it rest in peace. That place was just such uh, a game changer. And I've, I'm, I think it is for quite a lot of people of my sort of generation. You know, we've all experienced the, the, the warm welcome you received down on the range, the great cooking, um, you know, the fridge just full of chocolate. It was amazing. And it was just a fun place and you learned so much. Um, and then I've gone on from there. Uh, about six years ago, started going out on organised trips to the US. Uh, went to a few European trips, experiencing handguns, um, semi-automatic rifles, and the such, and whatever full auto, anything that floats under my nose, I'll have a go on. If you don't cost a bomb, I'm there. And uh, you know, then I thought, well, three years ago, because obviously with COVID, nobody's going anywhere. I reached out to some of the chaps in America and said, I want to experience this off my own back. Um, I want to do something that is something I would never think of doing. And that's why I basically entered the, my first ever proper three gun match. Um, I don't know if they call it a national, John can correct me on the correct terminology, but um, it was quite a big major match. Uh, I was scared, to say the least. Um, as we were discussing before I came on air, was that really it was it was an experience to survive it, to not get disqualified, to shoot safely, uh, to enjoy the company around you, make some new friends, some new comrades. Um, 
uh, even to the point we met a couple that had only just recently moved out there and they were originally from Wales area and we stayed in contact with them. So the, the following Christmas, we went back out there again and I've been going there ever since. Um, it's, it's a joy. It's an absolute joy. The, the whole idea of shooting has, as anyone would know me, I'm full of beans and I can go off a little bit like a rocket. And I do find that the shooting slows me down. It makes me concentrate. It makes me actually think about what I'm about to do. Because obviously, if it goes wrong, it can be exceedingly dangerous. And uh, yeah, I just love it. Absolutely adore anything to do with firearms. I enjoy the community, the brotherhood from it, the family. Um, and if, it's, if it goes bang, pop or fizzle, and it's not too expensive, you know, we all like a cheap ride. Uh, I just thought I'd just uh, give it a go. And even to the point, as I said to you the other evening, I've now spent me. I spoke to a lot of people last year. They said, oh, I haven't been down the range. I haven't had the opportunity to do this, that, and the X, Y, and Z. I, and they said, oh, you must have been really awful not being able to go out. I said, no, I hardly shot last year. But now my wife's doing it. So when you when you be, uh, just before we go over to Amrick, uh, you could talk about himself. Oliver, what, what point did you realise? I mean, did you surpass yourself? Did you Were you quite surprised of how competitive you were and how quickly you developed? Yes. Um, <coughs> I mean, there was, um, I think, third or fourth week after shooting my Section 2 pump down at my local club that I was formerly a member of, um, I was just thinking, this is amazing. I can push myself. Um, and to be quite frank, I never took part in any sport in school. Um, you know, rugby, cricket, stick it out of your ass. I, I'd never really gone for that. So I've never been an athletic type. I've never been somebody that likes to participate in team sports because most of the people I'm surrounded with wind me up anyway. But at least with shooting, especially with practical shooting, you're always constantly pushing yourself. It's a constant evolution in both. I mean, people say, oh, I'm changing this and that on my rifle, for instance. It's not just that. It's how you stack it in your car, how you load your ammo, where do you store your ammo, uh, your bag, where have you put your first aid kit, where do you put your screwdrivers. Everything has to be in the right order. And that's another thing. It's, all, it's organization. It's really pushed me to be not the top of my game because I've never – Expects, expected to win but just to be up there to enjoy myself and be able to hopefully say to other people this is what I do this is how I've achieved it these are the people that have helped me if you want to experience it as well you're more than welcome because I had I had a lot of guys older blokes uh, ex handgunners and all this kind of thing I'm looking at rifles I didn't have a clue what they were to start with they just go you know if it's legal to do so obviously and safe they would then instruct me on how to do it, how to maintain it, how to use it safely. Um, and it just, it just offers you so many things. Not just this. This is the happiness. Yeah, great. But it's the organisation. It's the, the competitive nature that you want to draw from yourself. Some, some guys I shoot with, they're quite happy to shoot in club level. I like to be able to push myself a little bit more and hope that I can get a bit faster, engage the targets a bit better. Yeah. Well, look, you've already reached pretty much the top end of three gun in that respect, and we're going to be discussing those things in terms of ability uh, from 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 one extent to the other. And just go over to uh, Amrik. Amrik, thanks very much again for coming on, buddy. Um, let's talk about yourself, Amrik. How you get into uh, shooting where it began with airsoft and where you like it to go. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me on. Um, well, it was pretty much the same as Ollie. Um, the difference, I guess, is it's, it's just recently just happened to me. Um, we had a company day um, and then I had a clay shoot. I really enjoyed it. Went out looking for where I could do more clay shooting, found a local club. Um, and I was just Googling, you know, how to hit a clay and trying to learn that kind of stuff. And I suddenly came across something called Three Gun. Um, people quad loading shotguns and shooting rifles and pistols. And I remember just watching the videos thinking, oh, God, the Americans are so lucky they get to do all this stuff. And then as I kind of dug in to talk to people around me, they were like, oh, well, actually, yeah, you, you can, you know, without having to have a license to 
and go through all the um, kind of authority and all the other kind of bits of pieces, you, you can you know you can do compete at that level with um, with airsoft equipment. So I found myself a local club in Huddersfield, um, and they did Action Air. But actually, what they did was they were starting to trying to develop um, <clears throat> what they call a multi gun, but therefore using a shotgun, uh, using a rifle, and using a uh, a gas powered pistol um, to emulate the three gun. Um, <clears throat> so that was about two and a bit years ago, and then with that, with those groups, we put on a couple of matches. Um, the first in this end neck of the woods. Um, and then from there, I met people like Ollie, who were just like, actually, you can, you can get pretty close to this. You, you, you know, there is a practical shotgun. There is, there is mini rifle. There is even, you know, uh, the long barrel pistol to shoot. Um, so then I went right, okay. So I started looking into that. Found myself a local club, um, and then basically since then, I've um, got my FAC, got a few bits of equipment, probably more equipment than anything else. Um, and just picking up all that was quite a big learning curve, really, um, because my local club doesn't actually shoot any form of practical whatsoever. Um, so I had to keep hunting and hunting and hunting. Found the UK PSA, joined joined every single club and organisation I could do just to kind of pick up all the information. And I'm on the. Um, if it wasn't for COVID, I would have had my first uh, PSG match, and my first mini rifle match by now. But um, that's all lined up in the next few months. So I'm kind of really eager to get going um, and just see what it's like. So that's that's great. That's great to know all that stuff there, Amrig. And, you know, obviously you're at the stage now where you you, you want to take things further. Uh, it's it Obviously, COVID has shut everything down. So that's, that's touch on the, the crossover there. And what sort of things, what sort of things are you looking forward to? Well, um, the, 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 the biggest thing really is, is just um seeing the difference because there is one you know the airsoft replicas are very very close you know in terms of the reef if you set your equipment up fairly well you know you'll be quad loading you can do um your pistols without the kind of faux suppressors and long barrel and the extension are pretty uh, i've been told they're re reasonably close they're obviously not a, a nine mil replica or anything like that but the way they move and the way you manipulate them is very is identical and the same with the rifles you know they're all gas pied rifles um so i'm just looking forward to actually using those kind of manipulation skills that we've been picking up with the airsoft and seeing what difference it actually makes the main thing really is that the airsoft has been kind of teaching us the safety aspect because you know if you go to any of the airsoft uh, matches the action air or uh, the multi guns you know you you can't foul any of your key safety measures you know you can't be fiddling with your rifles um unless you're in the safe area you know, you can't be pointing them in the wrong direction. Moving with your finger on the trigger, that'll get you disqualified, just like it will do in a um, in a full-on match. So yeah, um, it, it's those kind of scenes and just actually comparing the difference between the system, because as you all know, once that buzzer goes, uh, um, it's a different ball game, you know? Your attention just needs to be on keeping, me, keeping everything safe and keeping it moving forward. So I think this year is just gonna be a huge learning curve just to kind of deal with the kind of the, um, the pressure of the beep as such, really, and just making sure I can get through all the matches. So we just bring uh, John and Ali into this conversation with the pretty much what you've just been talking about there, Amrik. John, the crossover, the training, the differences between airsoft and real steel, going to real steel, the guns, three gun. What are we talking about here? Is there is there much in terms of changes and differences between these two? Not for me. Um, the, the basic principles of getting sights on target and um, following the correct manipulations to pull the trigger and manage the recoil are exactly the same. So the only difference is the amount of recoil. So actually shooting action air um, and the three gun stuff that Amrick's done, is going to put him in really good stead so that when he does go to a match, that safety aspect and those manipulations should be second nature. Um, okay, he's not going to be you know as fast as he will be in the future after practice and all the rest of it, um, but he'll be safe. And so safety is what everybody cares about. Performance is what he cares about. I can, I can certainly say that the every three yeah, I think, different. I think the key. <clears throat> 
was going to say the, the... I was just going to say the, the biggest thing for me was that I didn't need to have a I didn't need to have a license. You know, I could go out and try this thing. You know, because if you think really from from my point of view as a as a potential as a newbie, you know, before I could even touch a mini rifle really to go shoot a range, before somebody explained to me that you do there is an exemption that you can shoot under. You know, I needed to do my long gun course, which I did with the UKPA. SA, um, and just being able to have the airsoft stuff at home and actually go to the range with the kind of practical airsoft guys and just learn all that stuff just kind of gets over some of that initial thing and it also works out if you can if i like it without spending huge tons of money and going through all the fse um business that we've gone that we've obviously gone through now um i just found it a really the simple way to step myself into actually seeing if I enjoy this. Otherwise, you know, potentially you could end up buying a whole lot of equipment um, and start down a route that you might find that actually in a year you don't really enjoy it or you, you don't enjoy the whole competitive nature of the practice. I, I, can, I, I can only offer the uh, each three of those types of. Early, Ollie. Sorry, can you not hear me? Just over to you, Ollie. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, the only thing I can offer with that, obviously, you're describing three different types of three gun. You've got the, the real three gun in the US, obviously, the UK equivalent of it with a long barrel pistol, which offers its own types of problems. Yes, John's c correct. The training and the muscle memory is all practically the same. Um, the only, obviously, the, the downside, obviously, with airsoft is obviously the recoil and all this kind of thing. Um, this is why, when, because obviously, I met Amrit before at one of those airsoft three gun shoots, and it was it was really good fun. Uh, and again, I've gone knee deep into it because I've got a Tokyo Marui something, something, I don't understand those things. They all run on fart gas and they shoot the BB, I don't know. But um, basically, the good thing about being able to build your equipment around that is that I've managed to build a belt that will quite happily house for all three of those um, disciplines, if, if you want to separate them as disciplines. And the equipment, yeah, you're right, there is there is a lot of costings into it to be incurred on the initial setup. But once you've got something that is okay and is going to work for a long time, then I can't see why that's that shouldn't cause you any major concerns. It's it's when you do go and buy a load of three gun stuff off of AliExpress. Well, we all know it's all going to fall apart because it's all made of tin foil. But at least if you know that it will keep you going for a year or two and give you an idea of what you want to do. And again, if you want to move down a different route, then you haven't put that financial outlay on there. I've, I personally think that the the equipment you can use is good. Um, three gun in the US is very very it, it is different it is still very safe they do have some again they have some idiosyncrasies that we wouldn't do in this country for example they would preload shotguns on a table um in option two you would actually walk around with that um obviously you've got your handgun in the holster obviously it's a cold range so your rifle and your pistol are empty um and you would load on the line you could say that could be very similar to um uh, so very similar to things like um, airsoft three gun. Uh, it's you can still train and get yourself prepared for it um, because even when I went out there, I was like, "Well, there's a whole table of op option two loaded shotguns," you know. And because they were running things on a tight schedule, they didn't have time to explain it. So I had to get my squad mates to explain to me why do you do that? It's because it takes so long. It's preloaded. You just charge it, put it in the bin, and you're ready to go. Um, so the experience is different. They offer idiosyncrasies with each, with each type, but they do offer benefits that can then take you up to the full bore level, if you want to coin a phrase. John, follow up on that? Laura? Yeah. Um, one of the things that people can get a little bit confused by is the three gun thing. Um, well, three guns, only one gun at a time. You never shoot. You might shoot more than one gun on stage, but you never shoot more than one gun at a time. No. So 
all of the UK PSA or UK based stuff that is single gun discipline is still very good training. And regardless of the platform, whether that be um, airsoft, mini rifle, full board, PSG, whatever, it's it's all good training. Um, and it's all good cross training. So all of the um, principles of swinging a handgun from target to target are exactly the same as the principles of swinging a shotgun from target to target. So, yeah, um, yeah it's all it's all good stuff and getting into it is i kind of wish i could i've, yeah. I've done it now I've, I've, I've had that journey um yeah. it was a fun journey and uh, it, it would be nice if there was uh, you know if i was able to go through it again knowing what i know now and having that excitement and stuff amrit has got some good times ahead of him Yep. So what so what was it, John, that you think I should know before I start this? Because obviously I'm hoping to compete this year in in the UK and then hopefully um with some assistance from you guys I'll probably work out how to get over to America and do what I need to do because obviously there's a whole equipment of lending and you know and all that kind of stuff to organise when you're over there. But it'd be interesting just to kind of find out how you kind of what would you change now that you've kind of um if you look back on what you've done. Um I would have not listen to people about performance and i would have listened to people that were talking about concentrate on fundamentals keep the gun pointing in the safe direction and concentrate on your fundamentals your performance doesn't matter but at the end of the day to anybody else other than you um we get into it we want to go faster we we, we, we want to come off stages feeling like uh, our hair's on fire and you know, the adrenaline's coursing through our system um, it's all about going faster and faster and faster. Um, but for me, uh, my performance has got better since I've slowed down and concentrated on fundamentals. By slowing down, I don't mean I've slowed down. I mean, I'm concentrating properly on the fundamentals rather than just running around like a crazy lunatic, horsing rounds down range, which is fine. Yeah. I'm not saying that it's, there's not a time and a place for shooting fast, and but each target each target requires a certain amount of um, um, a fundamental supply to it. Mm. So, yeah, I would um, I would concentrate on fundamentals. I wouldn't look at results until the following day. Definitely going to every match with the with the only expectation of applying myself to the best of my abilities. That's it. I, you, you can't know anything about the results. Don't worry about. It. I mean, the only big lesson I took from my experience in Texas was, like John was saying, you're going out there to enjoy the fundamentals, be safe, don't be disqualified. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you are going up against guys that can shoot, and as often as they please, they don't have the regulations and all the other costs that, that impair them, uh, their performance, so you're never going to beat them. Uh, really, it's just a case of enjoying yourself and being safe and making sure that you can go back again another year and you can improve on your score from the previous year. Just because you will slowly improve as you're being safe. Um, once you're good with a, a shotgun, you'll always be good with a shotgun. Once you understand how a rifle works, enjoy the rifle. I believe the biggest back foot for any of us in these UK Isles is surely just a handgun. That's the only the big, big downside. Um, the only thing I would change is the amount of money that I've sunk into it. I, I have, you don't want to know. I mean, it's it's disgusting the amount of money I've spent on this. Um, I mean, the biggest thing was the the base equipment. Um, the first thing I thought of was I want to make sure that I've got the right equipment because, again, you can buy a Tim for AliExpress. It's not going to – out in Texas, for example, it wouldn't have lasted five minutes. It would have broken, and then you would have been in a lot of trouble. So I certainly overspent a little bit. I was a little bit over – oh, blimey, something's happening here. Um, I slightly overspent when I shouldn't have done, really. But, um, again, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the experience of actually being able to do that. Uh, just saying about the cost there um i've got five pound pistol mags um pouches airsoft uh, pouches 
and that's my three gun kit. It does perfectly well for matches like Ollie's talking about, Blue Ridge and mm. things like that. The only thing that my three gun belt costs money on my three gun belt that costs money was my shotgun rig, which is some old stuff that I had from um UK PSA stuff, not book it, UK based PSG stuff. Um mm. And I bolted all that to using literally stainless steel 10 mil bolts um, to a 15 quid um, weightlifting belt. Is it Gucci? No. And honestly, I don't want Gucci that falls off. I want a weightlifting belt that's not going to fall off. They'll have to take it off me when I'm in a crumpled heap on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had any issues with my mag pouches dropping mags. Um, uh, my holster. I did spend money on my holster because I don't want my whole my pistol to fall out. So that was a Safari Land GLS. But again, I was like sixty quid, I think, six, fifty, sixty quid. Um, in the UK, we have to have proper race holsters for our LVPs, just because of the barrels. You can't. I mean, you can. Um, you can draw it right out. Amber, it's gone. Quick. It happens on these streams, I'm sure he'll come back. Carry on, John. That's because he's up north. I mean, we're lucky he's got electricity, let alone internet. Blimey, when did they get like that? Gee, was these modern found angles. He's got a uh, yeah, nuclear-powered hamster. I think, I think the biggest expense I, uh, I've i spent out on was um, I bought the Carbon Arms ELS belt and went full chat with the ELS clips. They were quite expensive, I have to admit. Um, the... The pouch caddies I've got at the moment, I think they're all Paz Tactical. I've like say you've got a level three holster. But again, that was one so that I can use that exact same rig. Uh, I've got air wing caddies as well from a shotgun for 12 gauge. Um, and again, I I thought, well, my, my, my chain of thinking was if I buy the ish proper gear and the belt that's not going to fall apart, it will last me a lifetime. So, I mean... You know, these, these I'm seeing all these guys that are using carbon arms, they're using Safari Land, they're using the ELS clips. If it offers them reliability, that's the kind of reliability I would like as well. Again, the only difficulty is really sourcing them in the UK, which thank you for I do from time to time. Um, in, invested in three airing caddies, I can use, I can only even to the point I can use that as an actual shot full time shotgun rig. Couple of double stack uh, air. I think one of them's all pairs tactical. I think one of them's even is it Zahal? He's from eBay. It was about fourteen pounds, and the most expensive thing was the holster, which was about sixty or eighty pounds. So it, it, it was still quite expensive, a couple of hundred pounds, but it's worthwhile because I've got a, I've got a, a platform that will now click on and click off to whatever I'm using. So I can use the the AR pouches with a, for my mini rifle. I can click them off. And I can run my airsoft. Obviously, because I go up to, uh, I think it's Watford, like the Practical Pistol Club up there. I can click them off. I can go full time with 12 gauge if I'm doing some Ipsic shotgun. It's great. You've got one platform and it just covers everything. That's the one thing I like about the platform that I spent the money on. Um, maybe a bit too much, but you know, it's what the heck. I've got nothing else better to do. <laughs> Is this is this encouraging you or discouraging yeah. you? What have you, uh, well, you picked up? Well, I think it's basically that the equipment isn't really that much of a, a thing. I guess it's the things that, that's kind of scary because you don't know what you're going to get when you prepare to go over there. Um, and then it's obviously everything else about how you even find the matches, you know, where do you enter and, and, and how, how do you arrange everything else. But in terms of the equipment, it's always really interesting. It's it's good to know that you can pretty much use the same stuff over here as you can over there. Um, <clears throat> but the next thing is really is at what level and what point would you actually go over there and start these matches? You know, um, because you, obviously you have like level ones and level twos and level threes here, and you have like a you have a segregation kind of thing that you kind of build your way through, and you have to have a competition license. Same with like, shooting over uh, in Europe, but you know what what is the difference? up there you know what what is their kind of criteria for being able to enter especially as a foreigner well they don't really have a criteria i would personally say at least a year's worth of shooting at any given level in the uk should keep you in good stead 
So you know that you can engage the targets brilliantly. You can obviously just keep your finger off the trigger, travel safely, um, set your courses of fire up, how are you going to stage and reload and all that. Um, I'd say definitely at the minimum of a year with a full FAC and a fire in your belly. That's what I would say. Gain, gain a little bit of experience with each platform separately. Um, some you might favour more than others. Uh, and then consider it. That's what I would say. I mean, I, I, I went for the nearly, oof, blimey, nearly seven or eight years before I decided to give it a dive. Um, you know, I, and I think that for me personally, that my back foot was that the local club that I was a member of, a bunch of old timers, they went, oh, we want to get a Remington 1187. We've had those since 1943. Nah, that was the worst thing I've ever purchased. As soon as I got rid of that and... Personally, as anyone knows me, I'm a bit of a Benelli connector. As soon as I jumped over to the Benelli, away, totally much better equipment. You have to, <clears throat> you can make the wrong decisions and buy the wrong equipment and overspend, and you can also get the right equipment and not spend too much money. Um, Rick, what have you had, what have you had a taste of so far? What, what, what type of uh, weapons have you used so far in terms of progression? Um, well, so well. For, I've obviously got a couple of two twos um, as I'm preparing for a mini rifle to competition season to start. Um, I've had a um, I've got my section one uh, pump action shotgun that's been sat quietly in a safe waiting for for us to be allowed out to play. Um, and then we've got an LBP that we're just waiting to use again. It's just waiting for the ranges and everything to open. So I'm, I'm hoping this year with the competitions coming up that I'll, I'll get a reasonable amount of experience in. Um, to kind of um, put my cherry as such in on the UK circuit, and then it'll just be a case of when I feel confident enough to and find out what else I need to actually be able to go out there um, to start the whole process, really. Because you know, there's obviously people who organise trips. There's obviously just being able to go out there yourself. Um, you know, what other hurdles do I need to you know overcome really to kind of before I'm ready to go out there? Because it's it is the thing that's made me want to shoot. You know. From that first video I saw of somebody quad loading and running a stage and then seeing videos of obviously Jerry Mitchell and all those and the kind of the competitions they put on but they also seem to be very different to what we put on here whereas so far again very limited experience I've had is everything's in quite small bays you know you're not really shooting out to any distance you know even at, um, from the videos I watched at Silverstone shooting center they're only shooting mini rifle out to a, kind of 100 meters 100 yards um, but obviously shooting a rifle out from some of the videos you see on YouTube for the three gun, you know, they're talking three, four hundred, you know, sometimes even longer just to sit down and shoot a rifle. And it's something that I haven't done here yet in any shape or form, whether that's uh, prone or um, actively moving around and engaging things. So it's, it's those kind of things and just understand that, you know, understanding the differences between there, which, which I think would potentially trip me up once I go out there, because as you kind of kind of kind of leading me to kind of believe is that it's vast you know their their competitions and their ranges are held over vast distances and i know that you're saying that the principles are the same you know down range is down range regardless of which way you put it but you know, you know manipulating and moving in a much bigger space um you know and also in a completely foreign and different climate i can imagine would create some challenges that I'm perhaps are not quite ready for yet you're probably not ready for them yet because you haven't shot any um, kind of. Um, so in the UK, obviously, we have mainly IPSC. And like Ollie said, I mean, I, I hadn't shot an IPSC match until I've been doing three gun for three years. So um, I've been doing practical shooting for 18 months, pretty much down at Shield, the occasional match outside of that. Um, and then uh, went on a trip with Dave Kittle out to America um that was you know a great trip um good bunch of lads um but from a competition perspective didn't do it for me um and the following year went out to rocky mountain three gun which was a world shoot 15 stages over five days so that was a little bit extreme um but once you get over the understanding of the manipulation of the firearms being the same and the downrange being downrange then actually it's Yes, okay, it's over a further distance, but that doesn't mean any anything really. It, it's 
just means you're on the stage for longer. Yeah, I'm, I'm on a similar situation, went on the organised trips. Um, yeah, it was great. I mean, you're going out to different parts of the US. Um, first and foremost, you're enjoying a part of the subculture of the States, uh, which is a part of culture that's obviously alienated even in their own country. Then you get to a stage where you think, well, I'd like to do this on my own. Uh, and all I did was simply went on to some of the three gun Facebook pages and there's numerous ones out there. Um, started putting messages out, just sort of said, look, hi, guy from Britain, you know, fat and forcey, wants to come and shoot a bit of three gun. So what can we do? Uh, thankfully, a, a chap called Daniel came back, uh, just said, I said, is there any licensing issue? Because again, I didn't know. I've been out there, we'd, we've been on organised trips where you get given all, everything is spoon fed to you. Now all of a sudden I'm having to think for myself, where am I going to get bullets? Where am I going to get the shells? What's the legality of ownership of these things? Because over here, if you get caught with one bullet in the thing, it's like, oh, you're in the docks. It's like, over there, they don't care. You know, I mean, I, got, I walked across a car park in Walmart once carrying nine mil and a six pack of beer. I got shouted at because the beer was uncovered. I didn't give a crap about the nine men. But the the main point is is that I sort of thought, right, well, what's all this? What's all the gas? So obviously I've, I've, the poor chap was bombarded with different questions because obviously we have this banged into us. You know, it's all about security, it's all about ownership, unauthorized access, blah, blah, blah. Out there, different kettle of fish. He said, I'm dropping over to my brother in law's house now. I'm going to borrow his rifle. I'm going over to my cousin's house. I'm borrowing his Benelli Vinci because obviously I was quite a fan with that platform. Uh, <clears throat> he said, well, what handgun of experience have you got? I said, I've got this. And obviously I come out with this sopping great broomstick. And he's like, what the hell's that? Of course, then he starts taking the mickey and everything. And once he established, obviously, the manipulations of the firearm, the bit that's interesting in the middle was exactly the same as his one. He said, give this one a try. Brilliant. Okay. Obviously, I've got the uh, Ipsic shotgun caddies, you know, the Airwin Innovations, great company. Um, I've already got a few pistol pouches, uh, airsoft bits, single stack, double stack, just bits and bobs. I mean, my first ever uh, uh, pistol holster bits, the ammo carries, I borrowed from my brother and he goes airsoft and he does the old milk scene running around the woods like a bunch of tarts. And, you know, he. He lent me half all that equipment. So I went out there, right, now what do I do? Who do I need to see for ammo? Well, that guy over there. And this guy's just throwing sweets, he's like the sweets, he's just selling them. There's no tickets, there's no writing on your license, nothing of that sort. Uh, I just got given a ba big bag of nine mil, big bag of 223. Um, I made the fatal mistake of buying some cheap slugs from Walmart and every night I had to lock my shoulder back into place because I can't remember what they were. They were like Winchester double subatomic things and they were horrible. Boom! I mean, you, know, you see this? That was bought on three years ago. And there was no problems. Everyone was so open. They were so warm. They were so welcoming. I mean, apart from the fact the, the initial reaction is, oh, my God, what part of Australia are you from? Once you've got over that, or, oh, my God, do you know a man who lives in London? I'm like, yeah, all right, pal, calm down. Once they've got over that, they, you explain to them, I've got this, 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 and this. I've gone here, 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 and here. I know this fella. I do this, do that. They're such a welcoming bunch, every single one. And it it got to a point after the fourth day, because, again, I'm, I'm wandering around. I'm in, I'm in Wonderland here. Um there were all manner of things being stuffed under my nose. It's like, here you go, have a go on this. <laughs> okay. And it was great. I mean, like you say, you talk about Jerry Mikulak. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I'm, I've got my this Hayes Custom uh, Super Duper 2011, beautiful, beautiful engineered piece of machinery. Um, and it wouldn't, it, for some reason, it wasn't working with one magazine. And I just about... Typical, you drop a pistol mag, it doesn't go the other way. It always goes butter side down, so the bullet goes <laughs> straight into the sand. So I'm cleaning them all out, and my wife's just driven me around to the practice bay and don't know a soul. 
round the corner comes Jerry Mikulak and his wife. And we're just talking to him. They're such lovely people. They're so open and welcoming. And they, you know, they, 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 what have you come for? What's your driving factor? And I said, I wanted to experience it for myself. I want to experience what freedom's like without sounding too crass. The limitless affair that that country can offer you is unbelievable. Um, and yeah, I just sent a few messages out. People help me. I just, you can always ask questions. Bother the crap out of everybody. Because all they can do is say no. And I just went out there, just booked a flight, out we go. And obviously I've made some good friends out there as well. Um, and it, now, you know, I can go to just about any part of America. I can make a couple of phone calls and hopefully my firearms will turn up. And that is how open, opening and welcome they are out there. They're just brilliant people. Well, obviously, guys in the UK, there is there are certain restrictions as to where we can not so much handle the weapons, but it's actually where to shoot. You know, yeah. one, one, of, one, of, one of Danny is a, a couple of guys who have actually joined the stream there earlier on, were just inquiring about uh, practical shooting grounds in the UK. There, there, there really aren't that many, and it's fair to say that you have to travel. You know, so Amrit, just just turning over to you, have have, have you actually looked? at uh, potential shooting grounds or a practical shooting grounds where you can go to? Yeah, well, at the, at the moment, the um, I'm a member of three clubs. <laughs> I've got my home, post, home office approved club, which is my first one, which is in Wakefield. And then the things, the clubs closest to me, which seems to shoot practical, um, there's one just down by Sheffield, which is called the Lodge Pistol Club. Um, they've got quite a lot of shotgun, um, and they, they do the English version of... Um, three gun there so i've been told so that's somewhere i've just recently joined in the last week or so um you've also got rosendale which i hear lots of good things about you've got um and then north coats but who seem to put on apparently one of the best matches shotgun matches of the year um which i'm really looking forward to kind of getting my teeth into and joining those clubs but they are they are all over you know they're all they're all over at least an hour away of, with a, of, you know, a minimum hour drive way drive which is which is fine because it's a case of i just try and book the death so it, you know if I, if it were, if they were close i'd shoot every single night but obviously you, they're not that close so it's a it's a weekend jobby where you fit in with your lifestyle but those are the ones i've found locally who seem to be proactive and i'll be honest with you the hardest thing about getting into um uh, firearms has actually been finding clubs that a are willing to take on members because some of the some of the clubs seem to have be and again, this is talking very personally from my experience. Um, they're kind of like, yeah, yeah, you can join our waiting list maybe in a couple of a couple of years. Um, and then I kind of acquire, well, wow, you must be a massive club then if you're, you know, if you're close to membership. Oh, no, there's, there's about 150 of us. Um, and then you start looking around and you realize just how many actual ranges and how many clubs there are just around me it was phenomenal. You start seeing the red flags everywhere. You know, you start seeing, oh, well, there's one there. And it's like, google it can't find it yeah and eventually through forums and asking people oh there's somewhere near me that shoots and they're like oh yeah about 20 years ago there was a match once there this is what the club's called and then you you find like a 20 year old you know do it diy safari launch kind of website which gives you almost no contact details and you you really have to hunt and to find find these clubs and stuff has been really difficult uh, to be totally honest um and I think has actually been the biggest hurdle is a finding a club that's willing to take you. You can't just Google gun ranges; it doesn't necessarily work um, because they're all so secretive. And in fact, some of the some of the the pages I looked at um, for some of the clubs look, um, did quite actively discouraged you from telling people that you shoot. So it's like joining Fight Club, you know, first real Fight Club. Don't tell anybody in Fight Club. And it wasn't until I met people like Ollie uh, and John um, and some of the people that we met through John um, that other doors and other clubs have suddenly become available. But North Coast Butts have been phenomenal. They, they are a fantastically friendly, welcoming club. Um, you know, that's been a great, um, a great club to join. Every time I've been down there, there's been so much, so much help and advice and, uh, and stuff. And the, the new practice, the new kind of the lodge that I've just joined, that's that seems to be a great club you know i went down there for my safety briefing and everybody was there trying to give you as many pointers and trying to invite you along for the days that they're shooting and stuff which is great um 
and it's just just trying to find those gems and finding those people and those connections which has been the biggest hurdle really for me to get involved in doing all this stuff you know and there's obviously you know going to gun shows and things like that has helped because that's where i've kind of started to see the same faces and and there is obviously quite a few companies out there who who've been really open and really welcoming to me in terms of asking stupid questions and john knows i'm i'm the guy for asking the stupid question um and the obvious question in most cases so you know th those have been you know fantastic people to meet and really kind of encourage me to get myself going problem is is i didn't have that 16 years ago i mean when i walked into my first gun club i, I rang them up and uh, the guy i was talking to a guy called matt and there's a few guys on here that obviously be aware of the guy i'm talking about and his initial reaction was oh we don't we just don't want any old people turning up and i said well, you've advertised the phone number for practical shotgun in the local gun shop if you, if you didn't want people to go, don't write stuff on the wall. You know, and it took four weeks, um, four consecutive Thursday nights. I was driving down there and I was just, hello. Um, and a few of us, I mean, I took three down, one he gave in, uh, another guy came along and we met obviously Dave Kittle, that's where I originally met him. Um, and we sat there for maybe nine, 16 weeks. And eventually, this one old geezer turns around and says, what are you boys here for? Well, apparently, not to scratch our asses is not the right answer. Um, you know, they had, they, I was the first member that they'd had walk through the door or new applicant in five years. Um, and it snowballed from there. Obviously, a lot of people had come and gone from the club. But uh, it was a very closed-knit community uh, in the club but it was also very segregated as well at the same time. Um, black powder shooters didn't like blah, 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 and whatever. Uh, but it was just the case, I would just turn up, stand there and go, right, I'm going to get in your face and I'm not going to shut up till you tell me what's what and where's where. And now that you have people like me and John and lots of other characters that are very colourful and will quite happily bend your ear all day long to be able to... Um, achieve what you want um, and will impart any kind of information. You have to, the one thing about UK shooting, if you want to do it, you have to put yourself out. Nothing comes to you. US shooting is very easy for it to come to you because they are very open and welcoming. That is my take from it. John, um, clubs, practical shooting clubs in the UK, difficult to find. Do people have to, what are these new lads, new kids that want to get into uh, practice with you? What do they got to do? Have they got to travel, look for clubs? Where do they look? So you're going to have to travel. That's just the way it is. Um, actually, they do travel in the US. Everybody thinks that they have it easy, but um, it's all relative. So, you know, i got friends who travel 14, 18 hours to go to a match. That's one end of England or one end of the UK to the other for us. Um, but they think nothing of it because for them that's normal. So you're going to have to accept travel. When the hardest part, as we've said, is getting into it um, and breaking that barrier. So the simplest thing is to ask questions. Get onto Facebook, just ask questions. And then, like Ollie said, you'll start meeting people like Ollie, like myself. And when you start getting into the sport and talking to people, you start finding out more and more information. I, you know, in Amrick's case, sh struggled, really struggled to find any information whatsoever. Um, and in in a group that I ran, um, that Amrick was a part of, has talked to two or three different people and, you know, now has more contacts in his area and is able to push on because of that. So the sport, as much as the sport is about shooting, it's actually about relationships. And for those people who just want to sit quietly in the background and expect it to, you know, oh, I, I, I can't travel any further than I can see. So I'll, I'll only travel across to the nearest town. Um, why don't they do it there? Well, they won't. The, the chances of them doing it are pretty slim. So it's not going to land on your plate. Like Ollie said, you've got to work for it. And the way to start working for it to ask questions. Questions cost nothing. 
a Kenny exploit. Sam? Yeah, I think I think the the biggest guy who helped me out, and to be honest, it was Connors. Um, I literally went to the British shooting show. I was like, right, okay, I want to get, you know, I want to I want to see what this stuff is about. Let's go to a show, and it just happened to be the the big British shooting show that was happening at the time. Um, and I just wander around the stands, you know, and he took time out of his day and he probably spent a good hour with me just t just talking about everything and anything and what was it, you know, what was available. And then from there, I then took the next step of finding the, the Hope Office Approved Club, trying shoot sessions and slowly kind of worked my way through it. Um, and I'm trying to encourage my actual Home Office Approved Club to actually be a bit more proactive as well. But I think it's just a case of everybody, well, you know, I we had to hunt. You always have to work at it to get to anything. And I'm not fair. I'm well, as John says, I'm not very shy. I'm willing to ask a stupid question because I, if I want to know something, I want to. If I can't, I instantly Google it or find it on YouTube. And the next first thing to do is just go ask somebody who does something I, I want to get into and talk to them. Um, so you know, it, it's been a really interesting thing, and and just prepping even for like this competition season, like you're saying, um, I was fortunate enough to to be a part of what John did earlier on in the year. And actually, speaking to so many other shooters, meeting so many other people, and you realise how friendly everybody actually is, and how they don't mind me asking a silly question, even though I'm sure that I can't. If I'm normally, if I'm thinking the question, I'm sure somebody, at least one other person, somewhere is thinking the same question and you're stopping them from saying it. Well, talking of questions, that's also the very first question that came in here um, from. Um, Christian Barr. Christian has asked a pretty straightforward question, actually. How many three-gun clubs are there in the UK? So, real still, as far as I know, KFC is the only one that do it. Yeah. KFC, for a lot of you know, their Kentucky Firearms Club is based, I think, correct me wrong, David, down in Hampshire, down in the south. That is correct. Is that correct, John? Yeah, around the Alton area. KFC are organising, David's organising quite regular trips. He's anticipating organising quite a lot of American trips as well for a lot of you lads out there who are based down in the south. You know, uh, I'm in the south. I'm pretty much near Gatwick Airport. Um, I suppose it's a couple of hours drive for me, but, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. Ultimately, what you said earlier, John, you're going to have to travel well, my first instance of practical shooting in any shape or form was, bang, 120 miles. That was the first trip, that was Shield. Um, I think geographically down where I am in Hampshire, we are quite spoiled with the number of ranges. Um, consequences, sadly, we have lost a few ranges, Shield being one of them, Dartford most recently. Um, sadly, I don't think there's any... That, I'll be really honest, in my opinion... No, and obviously there will be better people that can obviously be a bit more qualified for what they what, what that say. But no given uh, backstop or gun club in the UK is really set up or engineered to cater for three gun because obviously three gun does cater for obviously centre fire and rim fire on three backstops. Every single. Uh, range that I go to is always built to a military specification with one backstop and possibly a fallout area. That is one of the biggest things is <coughs> the application of ranges and the quantifiable ranges that we can use. If we had three backstopped ranges, I'm, I'm, I'm literally saying it in layman's terms, that would encourage a lot more three gun. But sadly, a lot of home office approved clubs. I agree quite agree. They're run by old giffers. And um, sadly, they have their own disciplines. They have their own axe to grind. And um, as soon as you say anything that's different, modern, oh, we don't want to do that anymore. Well, that's it. As soon as they say, we don't want it, that's it, you're done. And that's the one of the that's the primary reason why a lot of people on this chat group and myself have left the club that we were a member of. All it was was surely one chap that ruined it for everybody, sadly, because he had his own discipline that he was in uh, quite good at. That's what he wanted to push forward. That was his agenda. And, you know, it was a great shame because we've got a lot of good characters out there that are trying to progress through gun and all hail to them, whether it's an airsoft or real steel. I don't mind. 
but we oh. don't have the ranges for it. Oli, that's do you think that's a, a function of so many small clubs, though, and not enough larger clubs? Because, you know, from what I've seen of the odd kind of um, committee hearing and stuff like that we've seen, I, I've sat through over the last couple of years for the clubs I'm involved in, their kind of military intake is X. They're, you know, that matches their minimum, you know, the small number of members, and their outgoings are almost, you know, uh, are comparatively small and as a result you know if they're doing any improvements their range it takes them several years just to, you know just to keep up with some men that's because the clubs are so small um do you think that will have a, that has an impact because it does have it has a positive impact because if you do have the characters that try and progress three gun ipsic shooting whatever that discipline may be um they help and they put a lot of effort into it and i think that's a good thing um, I, I personally feel if we wanted to push or make three gun more prevalent in this country, we would certainly need three backstopped ranges. That's my opinion, because obviously we do and can shoot 180 degrees. Um, that would allow, I, I personally feel that's how that would improve that type of shooting, that, that, that discipline specifically. Could we encourage the NRA to, to uh, develop that there, uh, John, Ollie? Um, NRA Bisley. Um, so NRA. So the NRA does um, a league or leagues of grass level um, matches, grassroots level matches. So that would be down to the independent clubs that run these matches in this in these leagues. Um, getting the, uh, them to do anything at Bisley. I don't don't know anything about Bisley. If I'm honest. I I I don't know. I I haven't I have no idea. There is a lot of progression over there. There has been a lot of change, but it takes time. It does take time. Well, Andrew Mercer told me that he's very much interested in practical shooting and developing that uh, discipline at, at at the at the shooting ground and. You know, I would like I would like to see this. You know, he did tell me to my face, and uh, he has people involved at Bisley, does he not? In, in yes. practical shooting and, and target shotgun. Yeah. So, how can we encourage? How can we encourage our our biggest shooting ground in the UK to get involved with practical shooting? How can we do that, Amrick? How can we do that from a new sh practical shooter? You know. Well, to be totally honest, I think I think having clubs just open to the idea and actually putting on more matches would be great. I think I know. Unfortunately, you have to remember that my experience over the last year has been during the lockdown, um, and I've seen the number of matches that are actually planned for the uh, for the next um, six months or so, and it's gonna it's gonna be a very interesting time because it's trying to pick week which end I can uh, get away from the wife and the kids to to shoot some of these matches, but. Um, it's openness. That's what it is. I says, you know, I've I've invited you know several of the friends that shoot uh, action air with me. Um, they're all trying to get on home office approved clubs, you know, and they come across the same thing. They they're just stuck in a waiting list. Um, I know there's some great clubs, you know, if I was to you know, which I will probably do at some point, but take the four or four and a half hour journey down to where KFC is, you know, I'll become a member there. But you know. Two hours is a is a perfectly acceptable travel mm. distance in the morning, basically to shoot a match without even thinking about it. But I'm just looking forward to just finding these ranges and getting involved. But the UK PSA um, was it was an interesting organisation to join because they had the safety courses. They actually let you go and just you know get your safety course done, and it, that was quite great because before I even shot pump action shotgun, I was always thought I would have go up an LA and. Uh, get myself an m2 and that's where i originally started and went and did the course and actually it changed my way of thinking about what i shot and it's just been having places where you can get those experiences and shoot those shoot different equipment um and i just think you know if clubs were just a bit more i don't want to say inclusive because i don't think it's an inclusive issue i think it's just um they need to work out you know why they why they are closed and why people can't join if we don't keep it expanding the number of people shooting 
you know, there won't be that one. You know, there's the three people here who want to shoot, shoot a three gun match, and I'm sure, you know, KFC I know do 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 them regularly. You know, they've got a group of guys, but it'd be nice to have another set of group of guys up here. Um, and you know, and the only way to do that is to is to open up and let people shoot really and get them become members of clubs. Mm -hmm. And I think that will in itself will create a critical mass, and there'll then be more people willing to put in the effort to actually organise because you know anybody who sits and organizes these events you know it's not an easy task yeah. you know just from the experiences we've had of just organizing the air the, air, um, the airsoft multi-gun matches you know just getting northern shooting show to agree to let us have a match um in their midst you know people saying they're going to show up and they're not showing up you know it's it's not an easy task and i think you know you you need more people to have the mob enough people to have the momentum to give groups of people enough time to kind of get these matches sorted and get get all the different things but as i said the ukpsa have got a hell of a lot of matches coming on this year that i've seen um and that's before any of the other kind of clubs put on their matches as well but it, it's that thing again is how transparent it is you know mm. you, I, think, have to, I think possibly it's also a case that you but, blow people's minds when you want for, to say using three If you if you go to a lot of these associations and say oh, three guns on one course of fire or, or, or just two for this course of fire and one for this and this and this one for this, they, they, pardon, it, it, it almost doesn't compute in their brain that you would like to do that. They seem to think, no, if you're going to have to shoot one firearm. Well, no, I'd like to use a pistol and a rifle or maybe a pistol, just the shotgun stage. You know, it, it blows it. <laughs> You want to do what? How? When? Oh, blimey! And it's it is it, it isn't an openness. I, I agree with it. It is an openness, but it's also the willingness for um, for people just to at least give it a try. I mean, my home was approved club. Basically, point blank, no. You know, straight away. I mean, I, I took on RO duties down at my club to do this, and no, first afternoon. No, sorry. That's wrong. Can't do this. Can't do that. Uh, you just think if you've got the ranges to be willing to do it, um, it's it'll be great. I mean, I think one of the I've only found them literally today because uh, my work colleague uh, told me about it. He does a lot of um, play vision shooting and uh, obviously CPSA again, an activity I don't really I shoot clays, but I don't really go to the whole competition side of things and um he was saying that there's quite a good club in cambridge that has um really pushed uh they call i think they term it as a psg bay but i believe that it is cleared up to pistol caliber car uh, pistol caliber um carbine like nine mil 45 i think uh again i could be wrong but they are willing so uh, this is this is the one thing i like about it they are willing to build a bay okay they are willing to rent it to people, but with stipulations. You have an FAC, you have UKPSA membership, I believe what I read on the website, and you have completed the appropriate safety certificate or competition certificate, uh, whatever the terminology is. But with those, you present that to them and you can rent that bay by the hour. I think that's a good way forward. It's the, oh, it's, it, it places, Clay grounds are a great place to open for a specific, obviously, practical shotgun. Um, and it's another source of revenue, I believe, that they're really missing out on. Personally, that's what I feel. I feel that they, they could quite happily open up their base. And one of the biggest and best things that KFC, I feel, has ever achieved is they actually got a local clay ground down here to open up for that. And some of the best shoots they've ever put on were at, at that playground. Absolutely amazing days out. I mean, the weather was obviously a big bonus, but the the idea that they've opened up their range and they're willing to at least give it a try. If it doesn't work with them, then fine. But it's when you beg the question and they say no, without you even being able to present them a legitimate case, that's when you hit the problems. Guys, let's talk about Silverstone for a second. Uh, I'm sorry just to dive out of some very good issues there. What is what what's the situation with Silverstone? What does it what does it do? Does it provide training uh, for practical shooting? Does it have the facilities to develop? Uh, I, I think the best thing is to um, get 
John on on another you know, next month or whatever and, and ask him directly. Um, mm -hmm. I only see what he advertises on Facebook and the occasional mooch on his website. Um, they put on matches, they do training, but I, I don't know any specific details. I think this directly. It's it's been good that they've done a series though and televised it. But, you know whether it's a, you know I watch it on YouTube every single time. I think it's anything that brings uh, light to more people shooting. And I think actually the it's more great people TV you get on the involved in practical will be great. Sorry. I say it's great TV when you're on the loo. Yeah, you know, like so a long time on the I, think, yeah. I personally think John John is a John is a great advocate. <laughs> You know, it's John is a good advocate because he has put up some very, very good and useful instru instructional videos, as well as his little TV series thing he's doing. And again, a chap's built a range from scratch. I, I, I take my hat, take my hat off to him every time. Uh, what he actually does and how he achieves it, I'm not quite. Uh, I've only been there twice. I'm not completely au fait about how the whole club works, but. There's another chap trying to push a range forward to progress a form of sport, an IPSC sport, a practical sport, whatever the terminology you want to use. I think, yeah. you know, guys, every time we talk about these things, I keep keeps bringing me back to the, the practicality or the, the, the development of ranges. It's, it's obviously going to be a problem. One of the things that we haven't talked about is, uh, is, is the, the authorities and in terms of developing a practical shooting range, it's obviously going to be a big, big problem. It's going to be a much more difficult problem than developing a small bore uh, target shooting club or even developing an outside range for that matter. So, I mean, what, what, what do you think the views are from the Home Office and the police here? I mean, uh, uh, I mean, they, they know very, very clearly that practical shooting is an up-and-coming target shooting sport. Um, I'm not sure if I should really comment on this one because I didn't have the uh, most uh, instructive uh, conversation with my FEO. Um, he was quite fine for me putting down um, my two twos. As soon as I started talking that I wanted to shoot practical, I could see the nervousness in his face almost instantaneously, and I decided to veer away from that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, mm. You know, he. To be fair, um, he said that he wouldn't grant me any um, section one shotguns. Um, until I completed the UKPSA safety course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. or, or something, or anything else along similar lines. He was a bit more forthcoming once he started to put restrictions in place. Um, I, I need to do this and then do that, and then he will look, really look at my um, thing. So I think it's, um, it's a difficult thing, really, because I think you know the police are always up, up against it, you know, it, realistically, as far as they're concerned. If they can have nobody have any firearms, that would be their safest point. Um, but the people that need to be stopping, unfortunately, get them because they don't ask them before they go get some. Um, and I think I think they need to be educated because that was the other thing that was a bit shocking from my FEO that um, he didn't he'd, he'd shoot clays and he only started to do that after he became an FE uh, a firearms officer. Um, but other than that, he was exceptionally helpful. Gave me lots of really good advice. Um, told me actually in some cases to that if I wanted to do X I actually need this or Y um, and need to consider all these points so he was extremely helpful I was just shocked when he was started talking about his shooting experience because I did ask um, again me asking the stupid question um, you know um, so I think they're in a they're in a they're in a funny situation really because in my mind that if they could stop anybody from having them they would do but at the same time they're supposed to do a job and check that we're safe and sound, which I think they do quite well. Um, and I think the individual people need to be given credit because I think they are running a hard line between what I assume their heads of bosses don't want them to do and what they actually have to do by law. Well, they have to do it by law is follow guidance. Mm -hmm. And by telling you you have to have a UKPSA safety course, it's not following guidance. <coughs> I'm not saying that um, that's necessarily a bad thing. I think... Um, having a, a safety you know got to have a, a driving license to drive a car I, i'm not saying that everybody should have a safety certificate but i can't really see an argument for not um even if it's a club club one um but you know again it comes down to the individual you know dave's mentioned there that hampshire are great even the somerset are, are pretty good wiltshire are brilliant 
Um, so it's going to depend a lot on the, on the um, actual areas, constabularies, and that's the word I was looking for. Um, so I think, yeah, if it, and and again, up north, you know, just a bit different up there, isn't it? It's, like, yeah. well, it's colder mostly, definitely today. <laughs> I was mostly trying to get touch, try, try to touch on the subject of shooting grounds, actually, guys, rather than our, our, our weapons, but it. In terms of in terms of uh, someone or a club uh, developing a practical shooting ground, a plan for the license, you know, to open develop the ground. That I mean, this 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 is going to be an issue. It is going to be a problem. I mean, obviously, what you talked about there, I'm right with in terms of the guns. Yes, the FAOs. It is their job to determine as to whether a gun is suitable for what you're going to use it for. It's one of the first things they do. But in terms of clubs developing. You know, uh, practical shooting areas. You know, do you, I mean, how much of a concern do you think it is for the home office and the police, John? I mean, do you think it? Do you think? Do you, do you think they're very much against it? I mean, they, they, they do they do see very clearly it's an up and coming shooting sport. Um, so, what, what do you think their views are? Right? I don't. I, I, I don't think they necessarily care. Um, the biggest problem you're going to have with ranges talking about three gun but you know practical shotgun is noise um yeah and the only other implication really is uh insurance it used to be that the nra had to sign a range off for certification for um rounds and yeah what you could and couldn't shoot um I, i think you still have to have it signed off by insurance companies but i know the nra don't do it anymore they don't get the uh, military in to do it. So if you can tick all the boxes for the police and you're not going to have a problem with noise, then there's, there's no problem to be had. I think it really comes down to the willingness of the actual club, the landowner. Um, I mean, like has been pointed out here, setting up a practical shotgun range just using birdshot is obviously a lot easier than just trying to set up a range to obviously shoot slug. Um, it's the limitations of where you are geographically. I mean, where I am, everyone lives on top of each other. Obviously, further north you go, the more free area you have, and obviously the less electricity because you keep falling out. Um, but you know, it's it is it is a uh, restrictions. Um, <coughs> I mean, there's some great clubs around here. Um, I mean, I've even spoken to less than five minutes drive from my house is my local club. It's on an army base. They have range cleared up to I think. I'm full bore, I think 303. Numerous times I've asked them. I mean, I've got in a pub with the guy who runs the clay section, but the powers that be, no, they just point blank do not want civilians on an army range shooting guns. That's it. Over others, they get a bit uppity when I sign up shot with my section one. Um, but you know, oh, you know, you've got a blunderbuss there, shouldn't you be out hunting? I don't know, bloody push me pull use and all this. I'm like, no, it's it's just a firearm. It's just a shotgun. Once they get over that initial shock, they don't. They don't. They really. They're that not not ignorant, but they just didn't know it exists. Um, you know, you turn up. You've got this 14 shot shotgun. Um, I mean, the first time I turned up with a Typhoon F12, for instance. I mean, Bob had, almost had a cow. I mean, he nearly passed out. He went white. He said, "You can't bring a rifle here. Said, it's a shotgun." Um, it is literally the fact that they just didn't know it existed. And I've said to them numerous times that the, and I, this is what other clubs such as KFC have tried. They've tried to get in contact with range owners and they've tried to impress upon them that long story short, there is a financial gain from putting these on, but the landowners have just said, well, we're not certified. Um, we don't want it because of this, 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 or, you know, we can lose revenue because of that and this and this. They put so ifs, buts and maybes. It's it's just sadly something that we're going to lose out on time and time again. Uh, my, my biggest concern as well is that, you know, what with the, this lead ban that may possibly go through, it, it could totally throw most Ipsic style shooting on its head. It's um, It could become a major concern is all I'm saying. Especially for birdshot, um, you know. But it, no, I'm going to disagree with you there, Ollie. Uh, yes, you are right. If you say if you're shooting steel targets, yeah, steel targets, shoot steel targets. Put laser, 
stick static yep. plays up. Now all yep, of a sudden right. you can shoot them with steels, uh, with steel shot. There's no problem, no issue. You have mm -hmm. to put the prices up a little bit because it's consumable. Okay, well, your choice is either pay a little bit more money or don't shoot it. Those are your options. Steel so, slug. We can use them again. Steel slug. <laughs> not, not sure how that stuff ricochets. Yeah. I think the other thing we've run out of the sand and you then uh, load it up again. How could it possibly go wrong? Stop being poor. Buy more. Um, <laughs> I think the other thing as well, say, for example, as it's been discussed in here, you know, you you complete your application with your gun club. You then apply for your FAC. You then get your FAC. And then you have another stipulation put in front of you. You have to complete your, is it your long gun course you did, Amrick? Yeah. Right. But also then, if you want to go and shoot on particular of ranges you need an ssc a safe shooter certification card it's it's more bureaucracy let's try and slim that down bring it back to as far as again you guys can disagree but i think as long as you've got an fac for that legally held firearm and you have a, a an approved um safety certificate from one of the recognised uh, 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 associations that are on. I mean, for me, I have to be a member of the UK PSA, NRA, I think it's the National Target Sh Shotgun Association, and one other. As long as you're a member of one of the ones that are on the conditions of your FAC, you should be able to shoot wherever you, you damn well please. I mean, obviously, you, you would go shoot a shotgun on a rifle range, but if you've got, like, I've got a 223, I want to go to. Shoot at Bisley, not a problem. But if I want to, for example, a friend of mine, he goes to North Coast, you know, that could be a problem because I can't just wrap, roll up to there. But if someone's showing my FAC and my UK PSA full bore safety certificate, I should be able to shoot anywhere I please. But, you know, it just sadly doesn't, that reality, that, that unison doesn't exist. Hmm. John? Yeah, it's one of the. It's, oops, sorry, it is one of the things that I think was was um, again a staggering thing for me to learn. Really, was that um, I literally have to join every club I want to shoot at to a certain extent. You know, if I want to shoot with a new, you know, somebody I met at the last competition and he shoots now a completely different club, I can't just go to the weekend, go for the weekend, go see him and and shoot there because a lot of ranges don't allow kind of just ad hoc visitors. There are some that do. Um, you know, you pay your pennies and you're in for the day kind of thing, but it, it seems bizarre they don't do that. But it also, you know, there's lots of things that I was, the other things I was like quite looking forward to, you know, doing as I was kind of seeing all these kind of range days and um, and stuff that the Americans do, which I thought, which thought were great, you know, um, you know, go learn to shoot your pistol, you know, go do, you know, have some actual formalized training beyond just doing a safety course, um, which is all stuff that, you know, it would be great if it existed here, but then the question is: Is would anybody else apart from me want to go to it? Because it's, it's that thing, isn't it? Because, um, you know, the first time I shot my uh, LBP, I basically just took it to the range, fiddled with it for a little while, got the hang of it, got the kind of the gist of what was going on with it, and then kind of shot it. And, but the, you know, nobody's kind of ever gone through. You know, you can't go do a pistol class or a master your shotgun class, and not that I've seen so far. And again, this is from my limited experience, you know, and I don't necessarily have to Google everything, but you know, I, I don't spend hours and hours trying to search for some of this stuff. But it's just talking to other people and seeing what's out there. I was like, oh, wouldn't it be great if they did this? Wouldn't it be great if you could go, you know, have a formalised range day or do this or do any of these other things rather than just write UKPSA safety course, right? See you next three. Uh, see you. Um, see you a match. So you'll you'll pick up everything else from there. You know, because unfortunately for me at that time. I wasn't a member of a practical club, you know. I was a member of an indoor range, you know, which is which was my home office approved club. So my experience was, what do I need to do to to start doing this fun thing like mini rifle or um, PSG? And it was like, right, first thing you need to do is go get your long gun safety course. Oh yeah, my uh, FEO said something about that. That's why I'm here to find out what about, what about is it. When are they run? Right, okay, join this queue. <laughs> very british again you know join this queue start that whole process but then i, I suddenly realized that the uk psa aren't a large organization you know my uh, you know in my head i thought there would be a this huge 
huge organization that push shooting but actually it's a lot of really passionate individuals you know trying to get their hobby to progress into something as as best as they can and it and it started that thing guys who's our ngb here who's our who's our ngb who's our national governing body here and uh do they work i mean do they have a database of clubs i mean who, who is our national governing body here so the ukpsa does have a um a list of clubs on their website are they recognized by sport england as an ngb have they applied for that don't not uh practical shooting isn't recognized as a sport well, police will recognize police will say it's a sport but um they it's not actually recognized as a sport well if, I, if, I'm, not, if I'm not wrong i think they've made moves to have it recognized as an olympic sport so it's under observer status but it hasn't been recognized by the issf right and until it's recognized by the issf it's not technically a sport i don't know who you're talking about there no but that's not uh, iss effort different john they're not an ngb i'm a, a national government body here in the uk I mean, this for me, that's it's stop the thick about it here. But they can't recognize shooting as a sport. So what the hell is it? You know? But well, you know, my is the fact that less than a hundred years ago, Britain was one of the best countries for the Olympic sport of dueling. Two blokes dread head to foot in leather and they shot each other with wax bullets. I mean, you know, we've <laughs> how far do we need to progress? And we're back to airsoft again. <laughs> I'll be with you. But yeah, I mean, they. There are people again, like Amrick says. There are people out there that are trying to push it. I think the biggest thing, is money. We have quite a few people that have got the money. Quite a few people haven't got the money. Associations and clubs, um, and they all have their own. They have their own disciplines. They have their own itineraries um and not always favorable to everybody mm. in america there is so much money i mean I, I i swear blind that i when i walked away from the prize table i mean that was the biggest experience was you know i had my name called and i'm like, Whoa! my missus said right off you go skedad around there you walk around as soon as you put your hand on something that was yours and i swear blind that i came back with more than the actual match cost. I, I, I don't care what anybody says. The prizes I came back with were unsurpassed for the experiences and for the financial outlay. That's what I will say. Um, but even to the point, so, I mean, I got so what, did you, to what did you do, Ollie? Did you dig a hole and bury him somewhere? Or? <laughs> nah. A lot of washing machine spares, pal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, sadly, a good proportion of it I had to leave there. I mean, it was daft amounts of 223, 308 a mil. I was just going up to random um, colonials and just basically saying, look, here, have this. And they were swapping stuff. And, you know, I, I came back with two, three bits and bobs. And I think, hmm, I can sell that, keep this. And it was, it was great. It, the financial input from a lot of the manufacturers, the, the biggest thing is as well, is the manufacturers are willing to put their money where their mouth is and actually support that sport. Um, I mean, you know, even today, the, I think a company called Dissident Arms, who make the KL-12, they have just come on as another sponsor with Texas, and they've put on, I think, a food truck and other bits and bobs, and it's amazing. They have, they, they are, there's a much bigger, friendlier community out there that isn't quite so heavily segregated through discipline and they are willing to actually financially support these matches to help improve them. I, it's, it's amazing. It is, it is an experience. It really is. It's, it's a brain boggle. Absolutely. That's Touching on a couple of questions here. I'll just go back, answer some of the guys questions question here from Bill Muir. John, what would you say is the most important preparation to undertake in advance of a competition? Make sure your shit works and that you know what you're doing with it. <laughs> Make sure the, kit, the, the equipment works. Pretty straight answer there. Goodness me. What would you say to that, Wally? Make sure you've been for a shit before you start shooting, because taking gear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't, I can't think of anything 
Anything worse so, on, on I, I personally, I personally, like I say, even to the point you have to understand where your first aid kit is, where your tools are, where your ammo is. Make sure that you're, you familiarise yourself with your range bag as well as your own firearm or whatever it is you're using. If you're comfortable in your clothes, you're comfortable in the shoes, you're comfortable with the coat you're wearing and the company, that helps to calm you down. Especially if it's like for Amrit, it'll be his first match and he'll be het up, he'll be wanting to get... As soon as you hear the beep, the red mist comes down, all hell breaks loose. If you have everything in place a couple of days before the match, um, I've even been known to have, <clears throat> have my wife shouting at me, I'm chamber checking birdshot. I'll get my barrel, I'll put 12 gauge in. If it falls out, it gets put in one box. If it stays in, it gets put in another box. I'll do it with 22. I'll take my barrel out of my rifle, barrel out of my pistol, and I'll change it so I don't get a jam. Um, and preparation a couple of days beforehand certainly has paid dividends. And a lot of uh, old timer shooters have, have taught me that. And they they've that's I've helped that. I think that's really helped me is to know where my safety glasses are. You're not having a panic when you're on the range or you get to the range, you're trying to bomb a mag up, someone's trying to do a range brief. You get in a panic station, all that. If you've got good company around you, people are willing to lend a hand and you know where your ammo's at, you know where your mags are at, you know where your firearms are at, obviously legally you should do, um, that helps to bring you know, your inabilities down and it just helps to smooth things out. There you go now, guys. Ollie Bloomfield says, check your kit and take a shit. <laughs> That's going on a t-shirt. <laughs> there you go. Very important thing there. Amrik, what are you getting from this? <clears throat> to be totally honest, it's just, um, for me, it's the, it's the nerves. It's the preparation of the things because I wasn't nervous and I go through kind of fits and, and this being probably very honest about it is, it's this parts of me kind of get really excited and then I have a little bit of thing and think, oh, bugger, you know, it's the first time I'm going to do it. What happens if I look like a prick and all this kind of stuff when you do don't it? Don't worry about that. You know, don't no, you, you don't. You don't. And that's that thing is, is that I'm on that roller coaster ride. And I think as soon as I'm actually on the line and my focus becomes what I've got to do at that point of time, mm -hmm. um, I think I'll forget about it. But it, it's that apprehension because it's the first proper match I've shot. Mm. Um, you know, and so I think, you know, and I'm sure I can't be the only one to experience that kind of up and down um, kind of emotion. I think once my first one is done, I feel better, but I also expect that that will just be the same kind of roller coaster. I kind of go up and down before every match until eventually, you know, I become as experienced as guys above me. Yeah, and they're just kind of, you know, perfectly fine. But it's that thing, it's one of the things that, um, that John's been kind of discussing with us um, and a group of us uh, previously um, was was about just doing that thing of just squaring yourself away you know not having to worry about packing your bag at the last minute at six o'clock in the morning when i'm trying to run out of the door to make sure i'm not late for the match uh you know but like how early should you get to the matches you know really? is an hour two hours too early you know you know because obviously i'm traveling too early. I'm tra well it's our thing isn't it it's all these little things that i'm trying to prepare for so i don't have to make any decisions that morning um just to remove any you know additional stresses uh Sorry, I've got my kids here just running around the bedroom. I, I think know. the worst one for me is I got up so early once, got so disorganised, I went up, I grabbed the gap, ran out the door. Sorry, lads, I'm still, you know, I'm still putting my shirt and my jumper and my coat on. Get down at the range. Ah, I forgot my bullets. Like, you, you get stuck. I'm, I'm just, right, I'm going to run around shouting pew, pew, pew all day because I, I, someone sought me out. Boom. Hopefully somebody came out of left field. Um, graciously, they graciously put them, they put themselves in harm's way by potentially running out of ammo themselves to help me out, which was great. Um, thanks, Dan. Really good guy. He, he, you know, helped me out on that occasion. Shame he gave you the wrong manufacturer, I favour. But <laughs> can't win can't be choosers, Ollie. <laughs> no, you can't. You never look a gift horse in the mouth. So I, um, I've done that time. I mean, my first ever match at Shield. I've turned up with my Remington 1187. I'm like this. I haven't got a clue. Me and my, my friend Peter. First course of fire was a slug stage. I'd only shot slugs twice before that. And that was just literally at the club to check where I was aiming. Sort of. Loaded it all up. Right. Are you ready? Stand by. Beep. 
I'll go to actuate the safety. Oh my, what the hell's going on here? The Remington 1187 had a key lock on the safety. <laughs> the safety, and then driven all the way down to Dorset and left the blinking keys in the front bedroom. I was like, ah. We've all, <laughs> we, we all made half mistakes. It's, it's learning from your mistakes slowly. Don't take too big a, uh, jumps between learning your mistakes. Graduate your learning curve. You try and learn too fast, you're going to be unsafe. If you take your time and learn slowly and learn to disregard some people's advice and listen to other people or take from what you want, that, for me, is paid benefits. Watch out. Kettle's a break. He's asking you, John, any news on Pro Shoot 3 gun? Nope. Okay. Straight <laughs> answer. Love a good answer. That, that was quick, John. <laughs> well, there's nothing going on with COVID anyway, but um, Pro Shoot have got enough going on. We're trying to get their range up together, um, just taking the back seat because of COVID. So. Um, the world she's have opened up before us in God's own country. So um, uh, with any luck, they'll be allowed out to play and I'll be able to get over there, but nothing at the moment. Yeah, I mean, David's expression of views here very clearly. NRA doesn't want us. Yeah, well, you know, time enough. Time enough they've expressed an interest on here, you know. Uh, just look it down. <laughs> Rome wasn't built in a day. We will get there. 30 and under lever. Yeah. Yeah, lots of potential. I think, you know, if, um, if there was one thing, guys, that you, were, you were going to encourage uh, new shooters out there or those who are interested, those who use newbies out there who are going from Airsoft to real estate, if you want to call it, and who are very much interested in getting involved with clubs and competitive shooting. I mean, uh, obviously, John, Ali, I mean, some of these lads are going to show some some ability early on, aren't they? They're going to, they're, they're going to show a certain a level of ability and skill, and then and then they take it further, and, and that pretty much takes sure. us over to you, no, Amrick. No expectations there, though, no? <laughs> no, but, no, no I, think, know, I, think, I think, to be fair... It, the one, the, the crucial thing is actually is 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 that we're not a fractured community. Yeah, I know the kind of image that airsofters portray um, because they run around the woods and shoot BBs at each other. But actually, what you've got there is, in my mind, is you've got a lot of people running around uh, using triggers and getting familiar with firearms, and that to them, it's not a scary thing anymore. Well, you know, in terms of things, and you know, if anything, there is a pool of people there under the set of people that should be having you know with the, with some diligence and understanding the difference you know they're moving into facs and, and things like that and it it's growing our shooting community so i think you know my son you know he, he his first example yeah his, his first you know his first attempt at using a, a pistol will probably be an airsoft one you know he always I, I shoot. disagree with you i think that possibly the airsoft is um Again, like my brother who runs around and he does his meal sim, uh, they are almost, I don't want to some. use the word, military. No, there's, there, is, there is some, though, but it is people who, you know, out of that fraction of group of people, yeah. there'll be some in there who might actually find Action Air interesting. And they do find it interesting, you know, and it, and it is, you won't, you're never going to get 100% of them. And you're right, and some of, that, some of the people I've played with, I wouldn't want anywhere around actual proper um a firearm or even in the same building as one um but it, it's the, it's that case of it's a it's a it's a mass of people that we should really be seeing as a um you know there's an opportunity there there will be some there will be everybody because some people you know like people some people are paintball some people shoot a bow and arrow and find that as their sport but in essence it's still Is there it's still a group of people regulations on airsoft people are there any range regulations on putting on an airsoft shoot I don't not understand. not really. Well, I think Ollie, I don't, I don't know if you remember, but we've put on quite a few um, inside um, at the Northern Shooting Show and bits of pieces and plinking range. It's just again, it's just about not shooting somebody else that's not a part of the hmm. um, the group that you're playing with. But realistically, 
you know, there, there is a, a legal limit of how uh, how powerful they can be, um, the FPS as such, for each of the things that it needs to be prepared for. But the, the thing is that they, they don't have anything that makes them look different. So what you'll actually find is if people aren't careful with them, if they're shooting in the background, and they'll have armed response around. Um, because from anybody from a distance, um, not knowing what they're doing, it looks like they've got a gun. And the fact that the general populace doesn't really understand the difference between where you would see a real gun compared to an airsoft one, you know, there is a, there is a big worry. But it's the same with shooting, you know, um, pellet guns, you know, air rifle, you know, kind of um, air rifles, you know, in your back garden. It's just about not shooting somebody else and being safe with them, really. Like just like it is, a, you know, the difference is they're not going to be lethal unless you hit it in certain parts. You know, you could take somebody's eye out and break some teeth and stuff. A worst case scenario, but if you're sensible in your garden, there's nothing stopping you from practicing in your garden or you know, practicing, you know, target shooting with them. Yes, they're not the most consistent thing in the world, but you know, you go to you go to other countries, um, you know, Japan, where you you think our system of getting a firearms license is difficult. Their, theirs is even, you know, it's ten times worse than ours. Yeah. But airsoft there is is huge, and there is the group that participate heavily in action air, and you get some of the best IPSC action air shooters in the world there. Um, so that's my mind anyway, because you know, I know we're always looked down as oh, the dirty airsofters, but I think as long as you don't turn up in full mill sim equipment, then I think you know, if everybody should have a go of it anyway. Because I'll tell you, the first time you shoot a 2 2 and have have your blinking day at the range, it's it's you know, it's an addictive thing, but then oh shoot back to the shotgun is brilliant. I first shot a pistol about 25 years ago. Now, I know I don't look a day over 40, but. The thing is, that was a very, very long time ago. And when you talk about Airsoft, what are you looking like that for? <laughs> when, you talk, when you talk about Airsoft, the first thing I think of is paintballing, you know? Mm. Because I love that so much. I did that about 25 years ago, and I had one of the best days of my life for that. I thought it was so much fun, you know? But obviously, I, I would say my, my first experience of paintballing almost put me off of any form of shooting. <laughs> I was I was 16. I was told ten pounds will get you this airsoft or uh, sorry, your paintballer and the big reservoir with bag of fifty. By the end of the day, I'm a hundred pound down. I've been shot in the face twelve times. I'm spitting paint before my burger, and the load of uh, university students that put the the ball bearings in the freezer, and you know, I'm, I, I look like an abuse victim. I'm coming on black and purple. Very Davis. Very Davis. Yeah. That was it. Was it? That put me off. That put me off for a long time. No, it would do, especially put them in the freezer. You know, there's just uh, there was a couple of guys on the chat box there a little while ago. They were talking about certification cards at at Bisley, guys. Just just to clear that one up for you, uh, if you're a member of the NRA and you have a shooter certificate card, right? That what that card means is you you are disciplined to shoot a weapon. You you will have a shotgun or a gallery rifle listed on that card, which means you won't be able to shoot that weapon at Bisley unless you have it on that card. Just to clear that up, I think some of you were arguing as to whether you needed one or not, or what was it, or what does it do? Happen yes, it basically shows that you're competent to use that rifle, whether it be a shotgun or a 308 or a 6.5 or a 223. doesn't matter what it is. It has, uh, a gallery rifle, for example, would be one of those three I just mentioned. A shotgun, section one shotgun, for target shotgun, that would be under a different one. So that would have to be on that certificate before you can shoot that at Bisley. Unless uh, anybody else can correct me on that one. So how do you get those, by the way? Or any MOD land, any MOD range. Yep. So how do you get that, David? Do you have to go and... You'll yeah, have, to, yeah. you have to do a course. If you're a member of an affiliated club that has tested your, your competency, then that's different. Like, for example, I, I think the UK PSA and their training could, could – am I right in saying that, John? No? Not the UK PSA. No, your oh. club could. So I'm a member of a couple of um, clubs. That's but, right. Um, they can sign me off, um, providing they think I'm safe. You can take a course. I mean, you can take a course. I mean, at the moment with the NRA, I believe that you don't have to. You don't have to have a very, very intensive 
uh, training course to use a gallery rifle to become a member there now. I think they have a they have a, a much shorter induction course which talks you through um, basic safety. And uh, uh, you'll go into a classroom and you'll get this, you'll get some practical training as well. And we'll, we'll talk about zeroing a rifle. You'll talk about MOA. You'll talk about lots of different things that will, will, will make you confident to use that rifle. I believe that you can pretty much do that at Busy now and then become a member without being a, a member of another club or an affiliated club to get membership of the NRA. But, I was actually uh, trying to sort my wife's out today. Um, basically, what my uh, form of information is that if you are a member of a Home Office approved full bore club, um, the chairman or the committee obviously witness you shooting a competition. So, for example, um, you know, if, if my chairman was with me in my squad shooting a mini rifle competition, he can then prove evidence to the nra for a ssc card to be obviously then released in my name for that uh, type of firearm then obviously it's sent to the chairman who then obviously hands it to me now the difficulty i'm finding is that my wife is a member of a homeless approved club which is a primarily a, a practical shot but they are homeless approved for full bore so it will allow you to own LBP mini rifle because they used to use shield a lot for members of that club. Um, but they can't sign her off for an SSC card for mini rifle, even though she participated in a in a competition only earlier this year at Silverstone. Um, she will have to attend with it. She got so she's got a firearm certificate and she has a 22 rifle. So technically, she cannot go anywhere to fire it yet or have any on it. So she has to apply for membership with the NRA and then she has to go and do a safety course um, with the NRA. Yeah, which she will, unless it's an affiliated club uh, and, 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 they, and they can show that she's had some training. Yes, on exactly. Day. But because obviously it's a practical shotgun club, they can't really say, unless they've physically seen her, they can't issue one for, for example, telescoped rifle. Um, mm -hmm. They can target shotgun but they obviously can't do it now i think that proves a bit of a limitation because i now have to pay for her to i was quite willing for her to pay membership for the nra i now have to pay for another training course of which is fully competent and has participated in the competition you know it it it's it's, it's got my goat a little bit and i'm quite willing to pay for more training more training is good but mm. how much is too much training to prove the same thing. Sorry, I, you know, she's, she's more than capable and competent to shoot a full bore semi-automatic 223, which she has done in the States numerously, um, and handgun. But yet, if she wants to shoot a handgun over here, she then has to go and do another course, pay another bit to do another top up, to do something else. And to get her SSC, it's, it, it, it's, it's proven a bit of a pickle. And I, I was hitting nothing but uh, dead ends. But thankfully, the NRA have come to my aid and they've really been helpful today in helping to resolve this issue. Um, but again, it's finding the right person, asking the right question, being adamant you're not going to give up and you eventually will find the right person to answer your question and the willingness to help you. And I, I ha I've, I've had nothing but help from the NRA today. Um, so kudos to them, that's all I say. John, you follow that up? Uh, what, so uh, what Ollie was saying there about uh, mini rifle wouldn't necessarily, as Dave's put in the comments there, if it's one-on-one -on -one tuition, uh, the RA is on you, it's not tuition. Uh, if the RA is on you, then you don't necessarily need that SSC. But if you wanted to go and shoot that same gun in a gallery rifle competition, then yes, you would need an SSC to do so. Mm. If it's not one-on-one -on -one RO. Um, but yeah, you've got it. I, I agree. Um, I'm agreeing with what Ollie was saying about having all these boxes ticked and all the rest of it. You know, the club I'm a member of is very good in that their safety to join the club, you have to um, do various safety courses. And not courses, but you know, you've got to, you've got to shoot the full board guns, you've got to shoot the black powder, you've got to do it as part of your probationary. 
there's no excuses whether you're a member of another club or not. So in doing so, they can sign you off. So, you know, you know it's all good. Like It comes under part of your club membership because you've already done it. I'm sorry, if it's covered in woof and goes bang, oh, I'm sorry. Some, some things you just die of death. Black powder is one of them. I thought you said you liked anything that went bang and whoosh or whatever it was earlier. I do, I do have my limitations. <laughs> I did get hold of a lever action rifle. I went down, went up, clara everywhere. FAC went in for an, for a, an adjustment then. And that's the second practical shotgun went on. Black powder rifles, black powder pistols, and lever action rifles. <laughs> Nothing but bad news with them. I had a go, but I wouldn't own one. I've got a, a black powder pistol. Um, guess you yeah, you're old, one, John. So once or twice a year. I, honestly, shooting that thing, it, you need good technique. And you're right, I am old. Um, <laughs> Sorry. You need good. You, good <laughs> you need good technique. You need to have good follow through, as that it takes so long for that charge to ignite. Mm. So as a training tool, it's brilliant. Now, granted, it's an absolute bastard. To, tidy up afterwards and you know cleaning the guns a massive pain in the ass but as a training tool no problem with it whatsoever I mean I've heard rumours from years ago that people used to stick their black powder pistols in the dishwasher take the pistol grips off and just yep mm -hmm. yeah. we're going to wind down very shortly but just before we do okay I want to touch on something here about the careful Ollie. he's gonna he's gonna touch on something <laughs> don't get carried away boys don't get carried away okay i know how far you go with us all right do we have a i mean do we actually have a database an organization that has a list of clubs around the country you know i've never that, experienced one we don't we don't john have you experienced do, do we have an organization do we need an organization to set up well, a database of clubs and training so by don't all clubs have to be registered with the nra isn't that the whole point of them an nra approved club it well from my experience there was there was the the way i found my club um was going to all those different organizations once i found out the Sorry. name of the organization and then found the list of clubs as a result so i think i found mine through the small ball a rifle association or some, something along that ilk before I found, before I found the NRA because I thought the NRA was an American thing only. So on my license, I'm 99% sure it says can shoot these guns while as a member of this club or any other NRA approved club. My conditions might not be NRA. Might be. That's, well, that's licensing. That's that's regarding your uh, certificate. That, that is a police, that's a home office thing, is it not? But yeah, it might be home office proof club, not NRA. Yeah. No, so that's, so if, that's, if that's the case, then if, if, if clubs need to be registered with the home office, then the home office have a list. Mm -hmm. Whether you can get it or not. Well, I think we need to have a, I, I think we need to have a, a database or we, we need, a, I mean, maybe we can do something here, but... I think I think we need it in order to encourage practical shooting clubs to develop their grounds and and for us to develop the sport and encourage people to get involved in it. Uh, also to in, encourage police and home office to get involved and to have have a look at to see that we're doing things very very safely. You know, can I just say? Can I just say from well, a, from somebody looking for a club, the most frustrating thing about finding lists like that was. 90 percent and i'm not joking about the 90 percent thing the contact details in those clubs were wrong <laughs> i remember okay. spending ages trawling through numbers uh, email addresses and i don't i'm sorry i'll probably make it i'm over exaggerating probably to a certain extent that no. it was so difficult to work my way around it because obviously coming from it fresh not knowing any of this stuff existed um it was you know if any database like that exists it needs to be maintained otherwise there's literally no point in it because mm -hmm. If I wasn't persistent, I would have given up. So while we're here, I'm on another tab here um, on the UKPSA slash club match. Now, granted, that's not every club that shoots um, practical. You know, if it's an NRA club that doesn't shoot UKPSA, 
then it's not going to be registered. Um, but anything that's logged with the NR with the UK PSA is here. I think the defining it, it, irony for me locally around me is I have a Home Office approved club that is NRA affiliated, yet at the time they would not recognise the target shotgun safety course as a you know means to shoot practical shotgun at the club. They only recognised a UK PSA long gun safety course as a way to shoot practical shotgun. They were also UK PSA affiliated but then they got re-quantified by another society that basically hates the NRA and hates practical shooting. So they're spending money out on three different bloody associations that just, it was counterproductive. You got, they've registered for a practical club, but they don't like you shooting practical for more than two minutes of a month, but you can't move with a loaded firearm because God forbid, you know, you, you, well, I don't know, have fun. And I, just, I said, and my, my parting words to the chat and the club in turn, and again, other people's experiences, I said, thank you very much. Thank you for destroying, physically making it impossible for us to enjoy ourselves. Mm. You have, and he said, well, what would you mean by that? I said, it's not really that you've destroyed practical shooting, but the social aspect and the fact that from our little social group, of which there was only seven or eight, we actually had three new people join and one left because they couldn't put up with it because they wanted to get rid of practical. They wouldn't want them to encourage it. They, they've pushed people out mm. and they obviously got their numbers. So obviously I can still stay in contact with them. And they, they made every physical reason to discourage any moving and shooting, um, you know, any kind of practical, multi car you know multi target engagements Ooh, you know the, the target had to be directly in front of you and all this and well i said but you're paying x amount for the nra but you won't use the nra target shotgun courses as, as a recognized course you're paying for the uk psa but you won't put any level ones on and then you're re-quantified by the uh, uh another society small ball society who Quite frankly, I'm sorry, they just like dressing in leather, which worries me. And that's a Saturday night activity. And they have physically ruined that club. And to the point that the guy who actually caused the police to go down there wasn't even a member of the club. He was a member of another club that paid to use the outside ranges. He caused the problem. Practical shooters paid the price. Well... Boys, we're going to have to stop paying the price. <laughs> and we're going to have to shut this stream down very shortly because you three are getting on my nerves, all right? Before we go, I hope that uh, all you lads out there who either watched some of this this evening or are going to watch it on YouTube when I put it on there tomorrow, um, I hope you found some of the information useful. Um, myself and John will be doing club and range profiles over the coming months. We're going to be looking at target shooting clubs. We're going to be looking at uh, practical shooting clubs around the country. Now, if, if, if any of your clubs are interested in becoming involved in that, just send me a message here on the target shooting page and I will get in touch with you and we will do a profile. Uh, it'll be an hour slot on here on a live stream. There'll be some video involved. A lot of it will be pre-recorded as well. And um, as I said, John will be very much involved with most of that. Uh, top shooters like Ali, up and coming shooters like Amrak will also be coming along and getting involved. And it provides information for all of us. We're also going to be doing little profiles on, uh, on shooters as well in the coming weeks. So, uh, John, anything to add before we shut this down? <laughs> Don't think so. Amrak, Ollie, thank you very much for turning up. Thanks for having me. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And we'll see you all next month. Have a good evening. Take care. Stay on there for a second, guys. <clears throat> well, that was long. We got a good two hours out of that one. <laughs> <laughs>